Good evening and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees, here tonight's top stories. The Foreign Secretary defends Britain's 20-year deployment in Afghanistan, praising its achievements in counter-terrorism and girls' education. Farmers are warning the government of labour shortage and call for immigration rules to be relaxed for EU seasonal workers. And a software company has come up with a virtual reality solution to reduce football brain injuries caused by heading the ball. The Foreign Secretary has defended Britain's 20-year deployment in Afghanistan. Dominic Raab says the UK and its allies made some positive changes in the country. Entity's Trevor Piper has the details. The Foreign Secretary on Tuesday continued to defend the UK's efforts in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. He said the terrorist threat has been reduced and millions of girls have been able to go to school. We hadn't seen in that 20 years Afghanistan used as a base for terrorist attacks abroad. We had, uh, with our aid money and our wider development policy, uh, got 10 million more children into education. I think by the time we've left, four in 10 of those were girls. But now the Taliban have come back into power, Rob told Sky News the West has to recognise the new reality. So there were real tangible gains for all that sacrifice. Of course, now the focus is to recognise the new reality, learn the lessons, of course, from it, but also focus on what we can do going forward. Rob said the UK has evacuated 17,000 British nationals and eligible Afghans from the country. But the government said more than 1,000 Afghans who were entitled to come to the UK have been left behind. Trevor Piper, NTD News. The head of the Royal Air Force says the UK is still able to operate in Afghanistan and is ready to strike against the ISIS terrorist group, despite pulling the remaining British forces out of the country. Entity Zedi Aiken brings us the latest. The head of the Royal Air Force says Britain is prepared to launch airstrikes against Islamic State terrorists in Afghanistan. So Michael Wigston told The Telegraph that Britain must be able to play a global role in the coalition to defeat ISIS everywhere in the world, including in Afghanistan. He told the newspaper, If there's an opportunity for us to contribute, I'm in no doubt that we will be ready to. Afghanistan is probably one of the most inaccessible parts of the world, and we're able to operate there. Western military presence in Afghanistan ended on Monday, when the U.S. completed its withdrawal, the U.K. had pulled out its remaining troops on Saturday. But the U.K. and its allies have pledged to continue to fight ISIS wherever it operates. Last Thursday, ISIS carried out a terrorist attack in Kabul airport, killing 170 people, including 13 American service personnel. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab signed a joint statement on Monday, pledging to stand united with coalition partners in their fight against ISIS. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. In the choppy waters of the North Sea, the world's first floating wind farm is offering a future template for power supply. There is a great potential for this prototype to be a major pioneer in wind power. NTD's John Robson brings us the story. High Wind Wind Farm off the coast of Scotland started operations in 2017 and has outperformed other wind farms in the UK. The key to wind energy generation is a consistent supply of strong winds, something this area is not short of. Highway in Scotland is around 25 kilometres offshore. We have an export cable bringing power just north of Peterhead, directly connecting to uh, the UK grid. One of the advantages of having offshore wind farms is that they will have less of an impact on the scenic views than if they were built closer to the coast. The enormous turbines stand at over 100 metres above the water's surface, with a further 78 metres of structure underneath. They're each kept in place by three anchors that use suctions. The weight of these structures, we're looking at something around 20,000 tonnes, and the power we're producing from these five turbines alone will power approximately 36,000 homes. The Norwegian oil and gas company Equinor holds a majority stake in Highwind, 
it believes Scotland could be a global competitor in the offshore wind industry. We've now broken in 2020 the UK record for capacity factor. So to the consumer, that means that we get a much more reliable wind profile, much more reliable energy source from uh, floating offshore wind than is achievable by fixed bottom. In November, the UK will host the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow. Its goal is to discuss the climate goals and targets of the Paris Agreement. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Thousands of police officers are preparing for the upcoming UN Climate Change Conference. It's expected to be one of the largest policing operations ever undertaken in Britain. NTD's Trevor Piper brings us this report. Police Scotland says officers have begun specialist training in the run-up to the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Officers anticipate confrontational demonstrations during the 12-day event. Training exercises began at a barrack near Edinburgh on Monday. Police wearing riot gear were tasked with dealing with a mock protest, with other officers playing the role of demonstrators. The force said they will protect the rights of people who wish to peacefully protest. About 10,000 officers from around the UK are to be deployed to the event, making it one of the largest policing operations ever undertaken in Britain. Leaders from around the world were gathering Glasgow for talks on policies regarding climate change. Trevor Piper, NTD News. As part of their two-week protest, climate change group Extinction Rebellion have blocked a road with a large pink table, used superglue and threw red paint on London's Guildhall. The group is demanding the government stop investing in fossil fuels. Entities General reports from London. Extinction Rebellion have taken to the streets the past week. They've blocked a road in central London with a large pink table, chained themselves to a van and laying on the ground outside Tower Bridge. They also threw red paint on London's Guildhall. London's Met Police say protesters have used complex lock-ons and have brought in specialist teams to deal with them. There have been more than 300 arrests. The UK government have already announced they want to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Extinction Rebellion want it done sooner by 2025. Earlier, 50 protesters created a blockade at the UK's largest milk factory. Animal Rebellion, an offshoot of Extinction Rebellion, locked themselves to structures and barricades. They want the dairy company to transition to a plant-based production by 2025. One of the group's founders was accused of hypocrisy last week. The co-founder admitted in an interview with Talk Radio she drives a diesel car. Later, a volunteer for Extinction Rebellion defended her in an interview on GB News, saying, we're all hypocrites, we're in a system. He was on the show to defend Extinction Rebellion's protest tactics. The group is now in its second week of protests. Jane Warrell, NGD News, London. The farming sector is calling on the government to provide temporary visas for EU workers because staff shortages are affecting the supply chain. Entity's John Robson has the story. The food and farming sector is calling on the government to alter immigration rules over labour shortage fears. A report organised by the National Farmers Union asks for a 12-month COVID-19 recovery visa to ease the rapid fall in the available workforce. It's some 15,000 pigs a week that should be going through slaughterhouses aren't being killed because they, there isn't enough butchers to process them. This then has knock-on effects potentially for welfare. Uh, we're seeing the same within our poultry supply chains, just not enough butchers to work in the processing plants to cut those animals. But the government doesn't want to provide temporary visas for EU workers. According to the Financial Times, Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng wrote to business leaders last week saying foreign labour only offers a short-term temporary solution. Instead, he urges employers to invest in UK-based workers. The founder of the London toy company says this is a very poor response to a very urgent problem. He says there is a massive demand for work from EU truck drivers and a desperate need from the UK for that service to be provided. Um, we are in a situation where we're facing um, shortages of not only goods, but when the goods are now arriving, uh, that we now don't even have the option to get them delivered. We, this farm as manager as farm. also questions the approach. We, as, as, a, as a farmer, are hugely passionate about employing local people. And, and there are many roles and career opportunities for local people here. But we simply don't have the people coming forward for the, for the jobs. 
The UK hospitality sector and supermarkets are also facing supply problems due to lorry driver shortage. Last week, McDonald's had to pull milkshakes from the menu. KFC also warned recently that supply chain issues meant it was unable to stock some items. Supermarkets have reported problems getting some products onto shelves. Joanne Robson, NTD News. A new breakthrough to reduce football brain injuries may be imminent. One software company has come up with a virtual reality solution to the damaging impact of heading. NTD's David English has more on this. Heading is an integral part of football, but links to lasting brain injuries are proving hard to ignore. Andy Etch's Manchester-based software firm has been working on a solution to the problem. Resol is a uh, virtual reality system that's uh, used by top teams across the world. Uh, they use it for training, they use it for injury recovery, and they'll use it for like new skill discovery as well, so development in, in new areas of players. Brazil's latest creation focuses on drills to reduce the number of times a player heads an actual ball. And on the heading side, we're basically, we've got some drills that have been designed by top coaches, uh, been used by the top teams to help you um, head the ball safely, you know, not with your neck, not, you know, not with the top of your head, to head from your waist and to, to really put the power in it the same way that an elite player would do. Problems with long-term brain injury are not only in football. Former England rugby hooker Steve Thompson revealed his diagnosis of early onset dementia last year. He says he can no longer remember winning the 2003 World Cup. Numerous studies show America's NFL players are susceptible to brain injuries due to repeated blows to the head. Football is finally recognising the extent of its problem. Research has been going on since the early 2000s. It's having an impact across a number of sports, probably started with the NFL, it's coming through rugby, and now with what we're seeing through players in, in football, it's obviously getting a lot of attention. And, and look, within any sport, we have to put player welfare at the forefront, and people are taking that much more seriously because of the research that's coming to the fore. Glasgow University research says that former footballers are three and a half times more likely to die with dementia than the general public. With measures to reduce the impact of heading only recently implemented, their effectiveness is unknown. But virtual reality may play a big part in combating the issue. David English, NTD News. Still to come, France now requires workers in restaurants and department stores to show a health pass in order to go to work. There's Adam more after the break. European Union ministers were meeting today to discuss Afghanistan and how Europe will deal with the expected flow of migrants. Ministers agreed to step up aid to Afghanistan and its neighbors, but could not agree on a common policy on accepting asylum seekers fleeing Taliban rule. And today's Trevor Piper has more. EU governments are eager to avoid a repeat of the chaotic influx of migrants in 2015 that caught the bloc unprepared and sowed divisions among them. Interior and Justice Ministers met on Tuesday in Brussels and discussed how to prevent uncontrolled migration from Afghanistan following the takeover of the country by the Taliban. If we do it quickly and do it right, then yes, then we will not see a repeat of 2015. But if we make mistakes and talk about the right way forward for too long, then it won't be pretty. The meeting comes as the UN Refugee Agency warned that up to half a million Afghans could flee their homeland by the end of the year. We are in a situation, of course, where we need a comprehensive approach towards Afghanistan. We need to avoid a humanitarian crisis. We need to avoid a migratory crisis and we need to avoid security threats. Western nations involved in the fight against the Taliban have already evacuated 100,000 people who supported them. 
The issue dividing EU countries is whether asylum should now be extended by the bloc as a whole to other groups considered likely to suffer under the Taliban. Johansson said the bloc should take in Afghan women, children, judges, journalists and human rights activists. At the meeting, the ministers also stressed the need to ensure that those in need received adequate protection primarily in the region. And for that, the EU pledges to give more money for Afghanistan as well as surrounding countries. And what is the most important thing now? The most important thing now is to send the right message into the region. Stay there and we will support the region to help the people there. But EU officials say delivering aid has become more complicated since the Taliban took control. Trevor Piper, NTD News. In France, nearly 2 million employees in restaurants and other service jobs must now show a COVID health pass to go to work. Those that don't comply risk suspension from their jobs and fines. NTD's Eddie Aitken has the story. Starting on Monday, France requires nearly 2 million employees to show a COVID health pass to go to work. The pass is mandatory for workers in restaurants, department stores and other service jobs. People who don't comply risk suspension from their jobs. Businesses that flout the rules face fines. Before the service, we checked uh, every employee to see if that they're a pass. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to do this. I uh, don't know for how long, but that's, uh, that's going to be, uh, that's gonna be the, the new thing. <laughs> Grunberg manages three restaurants in Paris. He says the majority of his employees are already vaccinated. Those who aren't have to self-test two or three times a week. But that's for uh, for now because the the tests are still are still free. And uh, but I already have a few employees that told me that uh, they were not going to stay if they have to pay for a test uh, every time they work. So maybe that's going to be a problem uh, eventually. This cafe is facing staff shortages due to the requirements. The owner says he has to use temporary workers. And as of today, it is becoming harder and harder to recruit. So we hire students or people who have no training. And it becomes difficult with customers who find that they're not getting quality service expected of us. But right now, we can't do anything at all. The French finance minister says the pass is the best protection for businesses during the health crisis. After an adjustment period, the health pass has not slowed down consumption, growth or investments in France. Customers have different views on compulsory health pass requirements for workers. It's kind of hardcore, but I suppose if they didn't do that, it's the French, isn't it? So <laughs> no, one would, no one would bother otherwise, would they? <laughs> it's indirectly putting a knife to their throat, to the staff, forcing them to get vaccinated. The health pass shows a person has been vaccinated, had a recent negative test or recovered from COVID-19. Members of the public already need the pass to go to cinemas, restaurants, gyms and museums. Nearly three quarters of French people have had at least one vaccine dose and more than 60% are fully vaccinated. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. Health authorities in Brussels began offering COVID-19 jabs in supermarkets and shopping centres on Monday. This comes as vaccination rates in the capital have not kept up with the rest of Belgium. NTD's David English brings us the details. Health authorities in Brussels began offering jabs in supermarkets and shopping centres on Monday to increase vaccination rates. Vaccination numbers in Brussels are much lower than its surrounding regions. 64% of adults in the capital have been jabbed, but 92% have been vaccinated in Flanders, the region in which Brussels sits. So in the beginning of the campaign, we asked the people to go to a vaccination centre. Now we really try to bring as, mu as much as possible the vaccine to the people. And so we're selecting uh, a number of areas where a lot of people are passing by. And so we try really to offer them uh, the vaccine at their place, actually at their environment, where they work, where they go to school, where they live uh, and also where they shop, of course. And that's why we opened these uh, vaccination points in the shopping areas. Vaccination rates have been particularly low among the younger generation. I didn't want to get vaccinated, I didn't want to do it, but as it's going to become like it is in France, to go to a restaurant you have to show your pass, now I'm doing it. 
restaurants, et bien voilà, maintenant je le fais. Some Belgians worry that their country will follow neighboring France and require proof of vaccination to go to cinemas and cafes. The, pro the Brussels problem is a complex problem. Eh? We, know we have uh, 182 different nationalities in the Brussels area, so with a lot of uh, disabled people, a low socioeconomic background and so on, so very difficult to target and a little very different kind of populations. Vaccination rates are also lower in poorer Brussels neighborhoods. David English, NTD News. French authorities hope the streets of Paris will be safer, quieter and less dirty as a new speed limit for drivers of 30 kilometers per hour came into force. NTD's John Robson has the story. Starting Monday, the speed limit in nearly all of Paris is just 30 kilometers per hour. That's less than 20 miles per hour. It's the latest initiative by a city trying to burnish its climate credentials. Paris's deputy mayor, David Belliard, says the city wants to encourage walking, cycling and the use of public transport. He said this is not an anti-car measure. Instead, it's about limiting car use to essential trips. This taxi driver calls the measure ridiculous. I think that people take a taxi because they're in a hurry. At 30 kilometers per hour, they might as well walk. I don't know how we're going to make it work. He says he's concerned it will hurt his business. And some delivery drivers say it will create longer wait times for customers. But polls suggest most Parisians support the idea, as long as it helps reduce noise and the number of serious accidents. The new rule includes exceptions for a handful of wide avenues, including the famed Champs-Élysées. Already, cyclists often move faster than cars in the densely populated French capital. Under socialist mayor Anne Hidalgo, the Paris city government has already restricted or banned vehicle traffic on several streets and multiplied the number of bike lanes. She is also reducing parking space in the city in a bid to limit car traffic. City Hall has said police will be lenient in applying the new speed limit in the first weeks. Joanne Robson, NTD News. And finally, traditional fairy tales have been brought to life at a Russian museum. A family team has built sets to tell stories and even dress up as some well-loved characters. NTD's Trevor Piper has the story. Three Russian heroes greet guests at the Museum of Russian Fairy Tales near Volograd. They meet the nightingale, the robber, and a three-headed dragon. Characters from fairy tales, folklore, and Slavic myths come alive through the actors' stories. Many of our own scenarios are based on Pushkin's style or characters from Pushkin's fairy tales. So this head of Sviatagor first protects our kingdom state. And second, it is an extra reminder so that people read Russian fairy tales. Pavlova and her family design all the items in the museum. Her son-in-law dresses as Ivan Serevich and gives a tour to visitors. The most important thing is to convey to the viewer the wisdom of the ages and simplicity, human simplicity, which helps to solve many problems. After all, Ivan Sarevich is kind, not very wise, but still, he always solves all obstacles in fairy tales, solves all problems. The museum keeps growing. Recently, the Bogolasi Enchanted Forest appeared. Pavlova refers to fairy tale illustrations and Soviet fairy movies to get the right look. I'm impressed, not so much by the characters, but by the energy that each of them gives. Energy of a fairy tale, hope, love, life. The atmosphere here is life-affirming. People come from all over the country to visit the museum. It has become a landmark since opening 15 years ago. I am surprised that in our time, people give not just their talent, but also a part of their souls to their beloved work. The museum was awarded Best Social Project of 2020 in an annual competition. Trevor Piper, NTD News. That's the news for today and thanks for tuning in. I'm Stu Lees.
Thank you for watching our daily news show on YouTube. You can also watch our other programming on Channel 190 on Sky TV or on Freeview via Channel Box on Channel 271. In the meantime, though, please give this video a like and hit subscribe to our channel. Have a good day.